Chapter 11 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 5, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 11, Fort Donelson. The news of the fall of Fort Henry created a sudden consternation among the Confederate commanders in Tennessee. It seemed as if the keystone had unexpectedly fallen out of their arch of well-planned defenses. Generals A. S. Johnston, Beauregard, and Hardy immediately met in a council of war at Bowling Green, and after full discussion, united in a memorandum acknowledging the disaster, and resolving on the measures which in their judgment it rendered necessary. They foresaw that Fort Donelson would probably also fall, that Johnston's army must retreat to Nashville to avoid capture, that since Columbus was now separated from Bowling Green, the main army at Columbus must fall back, to Humboldt or possibly to Grand Junction, leaving only a sufficient garrison to make a desperate defense of the works and the river, and immediate orders were issued to prepare for these movements. Nevertheless, Johnston, to use his own language, resolved, quote, to fight for Nashville at Donelson, end quote. For this purpose, he divided the army at Bowling Green, starting 8,000 of his men under Generals Buckner and Floyd, together with 4,000 more under Pillow from other points, on a rapid march to reinforce the threatened fort, while General Hardy led his remaining 14,000 men on their retreat to Nashville. This retreat was not alone a choice of evils. Even if Fort Henry had not fallen, and Donelson been so seriously menaced, the overwhelming force of Buell would have compelled a retrograde movement. Had Buell been a commander of more enterprise, he would have seized this chance of inflicting great damage upon the diminished enemy in retreat. His advance guard, indeed, followed, but Johnston's remnant, marching night and day, succeeded in reaching the Cumberland River opposite Nashville, where, after preparations to cross in haste, the rebel commander waited with intense eagerness to hear the fate of Donelson. Of the two commanders in the West, the idea of the movement up the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers was more favorably thought of by Halleck than by Buell. Buell pointed out its value, but began no movement that looked to its execution. Halleck, on the contrary, not only realized its importance, but immediately entertained the design of ultimately carrying it out. Thus, he wrote at the time he ordered the reconnaissance, which demonstrated its practicability, quote, the demonstration which General Grant is now making, I have no doubt, will keep them, the enemy, in check till preparations can be made for operations on the Tennessee or Cumberland. End quote. His conception of the necessary preparations was, however, almost equivalent to the rejection of the plan. He thought that it would require a force of 60,000 men, and to delay it till that number and their requisite material of war could be gathered or detached under prevailing ideas would amount to indefinite postponement. When at last, through Grant's importunity, the movement was actually begun by the advance to capture Fort Henry, a curious interest in the expedition and its capabilities developed itself among the commanders. Grant's original proposition was simply to capture Fort Henry and establish a large camp. Nothing further was proposed, and Halleck's instructions went only to the same extent with one addition. As the reported approach of Beauregard with reinforcements had been the turning influence in Halleck's consent, so he proposed that the capture of Fort Henry should be immediately followed by a dash at the railroad bridges across the Tennessee and their destruction, to prevent those reinforcements from reaching Johnston. But with the progress of Grant's movement, the chances of success brightened, and the plan began correspondingly to expand. On the 2nd of February, when Grant's troops were preparing to invest Fort Henry, Halleck's estimate of coming possibilities had risen a little. He wrote to Buell, quote, At present it is only proposed to take and occupy Fort Henry and Dover, Donaldson, and, if possible, cut the railroad from Columbus to Bowling Green, end quote. Here we have Donaldson added to Henry in the intention of the department commander. That the same intention existed in Grant's mind is evident, for, as already related, on the fall of Henry on the 6th, he immediately telegraphed to Halleck, quote, Fort Henry is ours. I shall take and destroy Fort Donelson on the 8th and return to Fort Henry, End quote. It is to be noted that, in proposing to destroy Fort Donelson, he still limits himself to his original proposition of an entrenched camp at Fort Henry. 
At the critical moment, Halleck's confidence and success at Fort Henry wavered, and he called upon Buell with importunity for sufficient help to make sure work of it. But Buell, commanding 72,502 men, 46,150 of them fit for the field, could only send a single brigade to aid in a work which he had described as of such momentous consequence. Afterwards, indeed, he sent eight regiments more, but these were raw troops from Ohio and Indiana, which McClellan, with a curious misconception of their usefulness, had ordered to Buell, who did not need them, instead of to Halleck, who was trying to make every man do double duty. McClellan, satisfied that Buell could not advance against Johnston's force at Bowling Green over the difficult winter roads, and having not yet heard of the surrender of Fort Henry, suggested to both Buell and Halleck the temporary suspension of operations on other lines in order to make a quick combined movement up the Tennessee and the Cumberland. This was on February 6th. Buell's fancy at first caught at the proposal, for he replied that evening, quote, this whole move, right in its strategical bearing, but commenced by General Halleck without appreciation, preparation, or concert, has now become of vast magnitude. I was myself thinking of a change of the line to support it when I received your dispatch. It will have to be made in the face of 50,000, if not 60,000 men, and is hazardous. I will answer definitely in the morning. End quote. Halleck was more positive in his convictions. He telegraphed to McClellan on the same day, quote, If you can give me, in addition to what I have in this department, 10,000 men, I will take Fort Henry, cut the enemy's line, and paralyze Columbus. Give me 25,000, and I will threaten Nashville, and cut off railroad communication so as to force the enemy to abandon Bowling Green without a battle. End quote. News of the fall of Fort Henry having been received at Washington, McClellan, 24 hours later, telegraphed to Halleck, quote, Either Buell or yourself should soon go to the scene of operations. Why not have Buell take the line of the Tennessee and operate on Nashville while your troops turn Columbus? These two points gained, a combined movement on Memphis will be next in order. End quote. The dispatch was in substance repeated to Buell, who by this time thought he had made up his mind, for two hours later he answered, quote, I cannot on reflection think that a change of my line would be advisable. I hope General Grant will not require further reinforcements. I will go if necessary. End quote. Thus, on the night of the 7th, with the sole aid from himself of the single drilled brigade from Green River and the eight raw regiments from Ohio and Indiana, he proposed to leave the important central line on which Grant had started to its chances. A night's reflection made him doubt the correctness of his decision, for he telegraphed on the morning of the 8th, quote, I am concentrating and preparing, but will not decide definitely yet. End quote. Halleck's views were less changeable. At noon on the 8th, he again urged that Buell should transfer the bulk of his forces to the Cumberland River to move by water on Nashville. To secure this cooperation, he further proposed a modification of department lines to give Buell command on the Cumberland and Hitchcock or Sherman on the Tennessee, with superior command for himself over both. No immediate response came from Washington, and three days elapsed when Halleck asked Buell specifically, quote, Can't you come with all your available forces and command the column up the Cumberland? I shall go to the Tennessee this week. End quote. Buell's desire, vibrating like a pendulum between the two brilliant opportunities before him, now swung toward Halleck's proposal, but with indefiniteness and fatal slowness. He answered that he would go either to the Cumberland or to the Tennessee, but that it would require ten days to transfer his troops. During his hesitation, events forced him to a new conclusion. News came that the rebels had evacuated Bowling Green, and he telegraphed, quote, The evacuation of Bowling Green, leaving the way open to Nashville, makes it proper to resume my original plan. I shall advance on Nashville with all the speed I can, end quote. From this last determination, Halleck appealed beseechingly to the General-in-Chief. He announced that Grant had formally invested Fort Donelson, and that the bombardment was progressing favorably, but he further explained that since the evacuation of Bowling Green, the enemy were concentrating against Grant. He claimed that it was bad strategy for Buell to advance on Nashville over broken bridges and bad roads, and this point he reiterated with emphasis. He telegraphed on February 16th, quote, 
I am still decidedly of the opinion that Buell should not advance on Nashville, but come to the Cumberland with his available forces. United to Grant, we can take and hold Fort Donelson and Clarksville, and by another central movement, cut off both Columbus and Nashville. Unless we can take Fort Donelson very soon, we shall have the whole force of the enemy on us. Fort Donelson is the turning point of the war, and we must take it at whatever sacrifice. End quote. But his appeal was unavailing. McClellan took sides with Buell, insisting that to occupy Nashville would be most decisive. Buell had indeed ordered Nelson's division to go to the help of Grant, but in the conflict of his own doubts and intentions, the orders had been so tardy that Nelson's embarkation was only beginning on the day when Donelson surrendered. McClellan's further conditional order to Buell, to help Grant if it were necessary, offered a yet more distant prospect of succor. If the siege of Donelson had been prolonged, assistance from these directions would, of course, have been found useful. In the actual state of facts, however, they show both Buell and McClellan incapable, even under continued pressure, of seizing and utilizing the fleeting chances of war which so often turn the scale of success and which so distinctly call out to the higher qualities of military leadership. Amidst the sluggish counsels of commanders of departments, the energy of Grant and the courage and intrepidity of his raw Western soldiers had already decided one of the great crises of the war. Grant had announced to Halleck that he would storm Fort Donelson on the 8th of February, but he failed to count one of the chances of delay. Quote, I contemplated taking Fort Donelson today with infantry and cavalry alone, reported he, but all my troops may be kept busily engaged in saving what we now have from the rapidly rising waters. End quote. This detention served to change the whole character of the undertaking. If he could have marched and attacked on the 8th, he would have found but 6,000 men in the fort, which his own troops largely outnumbered. As it turned out, the half of Johnston's army sent from Bowling Green and other points, conducted by Generals Pillow, Floyd, and Buckner, arrived before the fort was invested, increasing the garrison to an aggregate of 17,000, and greatly extending the line of rifle pits and other defenses. Begin footnote. General Grant's estimate of the Confederate forces is 21,000. He says he marched against the fort with but 15,000, but that he received reinforcements before the attack, and their arrival had, at the time of the surrender, increased his army to about 27,000. Grant, Personal Memoirs, Volume 1, pages 299, 305, 315, and footnote. This presented an altogether different and more serious problem. The enemy before Grant was now, if not superior, at least equal in numbers, and had besides the protection of a large and well-constructed earthwork, armed with seventeen heavy and forty-eight field guns. It is probable that this changed aspect of affairs was not immediately known to him. If it was, he depended on the reinforcements which Halleck promised, and which soon began to arrive. Early on the morning of the 12th, he started on his march, with the divisions of McClernand and of Brigadier General C.F. Smith, numbering 15,000. At noon, they were within two miles of Donelson. That afternoon, and all the following day, February 13th, were occupied in driving in the rebel pickets, finding the approaches, and drawing the lines of investment around the fort. A gallant storming assault by four Illinois regiments upon one of the rebel batteries was an exciting incident of the afternoon's advance, but was unsuccessful. To understand the full merit of the final achievement, the conditions under which the siege of Donelson was thus begun must be briefly mentioned. The principal fort, or earthwork, which bore the military name, lay on the west bank of the Cumberland River, half a mile north of the little town of Dover. The fort occupied the terminal knoll of a high ridge ending in the angle between the river and the mouth of Hickman Creek. This main work consisted of two batteries of heavy guns, primarily designed to control the river navigation. But when General Johnson resolved to defend Nashville at Donelson, and gathered an army of 17,000 men for the purpose, the original fort and the town of Dover, and all the intervening space, were enclosed by a long, irregular line of rifle pits, connecting more substantial breastworks and embankments on the favorable elevations, in which field batteries were planted. The whole chain of entrenchments, extending from Hickman Creek on the north till it enclosed the town of Dover on the south, having a total length of about two and a half miles. Outside the rifle pits were the usual obstructions of felled trees and abatis, forming an interlacing barrier difficult to penetrate. 
the Union troops had had no fighting at Fort Henry. At that place, the gunboats had done the work. The debarkation on the Tennessee, the reconnaissance, the march towards Donelson, the picket skirmishing during the 12th and 13th, had only been such as to give them zest and exhilaration. When, on the morning of the 12th, the march began, the weather was mild and agreeable. But on the afternoon of the 13th, while the army was stretching itself cautiously around the rebel entrenchments, the thermometer suddenly went down. A winter storm set in, with rain, snow, sleet, ice, and a piercing northwest wind that made the men lament the imprudence they had committed in leaving overcoats and blankets behind. Grant's army was composed entirely of western regiments, fifteen from the single state of Illinois, and a further aggregate of seventeen from the states of Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, Missouri, and Iowa. Some of these regiments had seen guerrilla fighting in Missouri, some had been through the Battle of Belmont, but many were new to the privations and dangers of an active campaign. Nearly all the officers came from civil life, but a common thought, energy, and will animated the whole mass. It was neither discipline nor mere military ambition. It was patriot work in its noblest and purest form. They had left their homes and varied peaceful occupations to defend the government and put down the rebellion. They were in the flush and exaltation of a common heroic impulse. In such a mood, the rawest recruit was as brave as the oldest veteran, and in this spirit they endured hunger and cold, faced snow and ice, held tenaciously the lines of the siege, climbed without flinching through the tangled abbey, and advanced into the deadly fire from the rifle pits with a purpose and a devotion never excelled by soldiers of any nation or epoch. Flag Officer Foote, with six gunboats, arrived on the evening of the 13th, also six regiments sent by water. Fort Henry had been reduced by the gunboats alone, and it was resolved first to try the effect of these new and powerful fighting machines upon the works of Donelson. Accordingly, on Friday, February 14th, the assault was begun by an attack from the six gunboats. As before, the situation of the fort enabled the four ironclads to advance upstream towards the batteries, the engines holding them steadily against the swift current, presenting their heavily plated bows as a target for the enemy. The attack had lasted for an hour and a half. The ironclads were within four hundred yards of the rebel embankments, the heavy armor was successfully resisting the shot and shell from the fort, the fire of the enemy was slackening, indicating that the water batteries were becoming untenable, when two of the gunboats were suddenly disabled and drifted out of the fight, one having her wheel carried away, and the other her tiller ropes damaged. These accidents, due to the weakness and exposure of the pilot houses, compelled a cessation of the river attack and a withdrawal of the gunboats for repairs, and gave the beleaguered garrison corresponding exultation and confidence. Flag Officer Foote had been wounded in the attack, and deeming it necessary to take his disabled vessels temporarily back to Cairo, he requested Grant to visit him for consultation. Grant, therefore, went on board one of the gunboats before dawn on the morning of the 15th, and it was arranged between the commanders that he should perfect his lines and hold the fort in siege until Foote could return from Cairo to assist in renewing the attack. During all this time there had been a fluctuation of fear and hope in the garrison, from the repulse of McClernand's assault on the 13th, the prompt investment of the fort, the gunboat attack, and its repulse. There was want of harmony between Floyd, Pillow, and Buckner, the three commanders within the fort. Prior to the gunboat attack, a bold sortie was resolved upon, which project was, however, abandoned through the orders or non-compliance of Pillow. That night, the second council of war determined to make a serious effort to extricate the garrison. At six o'clock on the morning of the 15th, the divisions of Pillow and Buckner moved out to attack McClernand's division and, if possible, opened an avenue of retreat by the road running southward from Dover to Charlotte. The Confederates made their attack, not only with spirit, but with superior numbers. Driving back McClernand's right, they were, by eleven o'clock in the forenoon, in complete possession of the Charlotte road. Buckner, who simultaneously attacked McClernand's left, did not fare so well. He was repulsed, and compelled to retire to the entrenchments from which he had issued. At this critical point, Grant returned from his visit to Foote. What he found, and what he did, is stated with brevity in the message he hastily sent back. Quote, 
if all the gunboats that can will immediately make their appearance to the enemy it may secure us a victory otherwise all may be defeated a terrible conflict ensued in my absence which has demoralized a portion of my command and i think the enemy is much more so if the gunboats do not show themselves it will reassure the enemy and still further demoralize our troops i must order a charge to save appearances i do not expect the gunboats to go into action but to make appearance and throw a few shells at a long range End quote. in execution of the design here announced grant sent an order to general c f smith commanding the second division who held the extreme left of the investing line to storm the entrenchments in front of him his men had as yet had no severe fighting and now went forward enthusiastically carrying an important outwork with impetuous gallantry learning of his success grant in turn ordered forward the entire remainder of his force under brigadier general lew wallace and general mcclernand this order was executed during the forenoon and by nightfall the whole of the ground lost by the enemy's morning attack was fully regained there is a conflict of testimony about the object of the attack of the enemy buckner says it was to effect the immediate escape of the garrison pillow says he had no such understanding and that neither he nor any one else made preparation for departure the opportunity therefore which his division had during the forenoon to retire by the open road to charlotte was not improved by evening the chance was gone for the federals had once more closed that avenue of escape during the night of the fifteenth the confederate commanders met in council to decide what they should do buckner the junior very emphatically gave the others to understand that the situation of the garrison was desperate and that it would require but an hour or two of assault on the next morning to capture his portion of the defences such a contingency left them no practical alternative floyd and pillow had exaggerated ideas of the personal danger they would be in from the government if they permitted themselves to become prisoners and made known their great solicitude to get away an agreement was therefore reached through which floyd the senior general first turned over his command to pillow then pillow the second in command in the same way relinquished his authority to buckner the junior general this formality completed pillow hastily crossed the river and went to clarksville with his staff while floyd taking advantage of the arrival of a rebel steamer boarded it with his personal followers during the night and abandoned the fort and its garrison as usual the active correspondents of western newspapers were with the expedition and through their telegram something of the varying fortunes of the kentucky campaign and the donelson siege had become known to the country while president lincoln at washington gleaned still further details from the scattering official reports which came to the war department through army channels the new events again aroused his most intense solicitude and prompted him to send the following suggestion by telegraph to halleck Quote, you have fort donelson safe unless grant shall be overwhelmed from outside to prevent which latter will i think require all the vigilance energy and skill of yourself and buell acting in full cooperation columbus will not get it grant but the force from bowling green will they hold the railroad from bowling green to within a few miles of fort donelson with the bridge at clarksville undisturbed it is unsafe to rely that they will not dare expose nashville to buell a small part of their force can retire slowly towards nashville breaking up the railroad as they go and keep buell out of that city twenty days meantime nashville will be abundantly defended by forces from all south and perhaps from here at manassas could not a cavalry force from general thomas on the upper cumberland dash across almost unresisted and cut the railroad at or near knoxville tennessee in the midst of a bombardment at fort donelson why could not a gunboat run up and destroy the bridge at clarksville our success or failure at fort donelson is vastly important and i beg you to put your soul in the effort i send a copy of this to buell End quote. before this telegram reached its destination the siege of donelson was terminated on sunday morning the sixteenth of february when the troops composing the federal line of investment were preparing for a final assault a note came from buckner to grant proposing an armistice to arrange terms of capitulation the language of grant's reply served to crown the fame of his achievement Quote, yours of this date proposing armistice and appointment of commissioners to settle terms of capitulation is just received no terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted i propose to move immediately upon your works End quote. 
his resolute phrase gained him a prouder title than was ever bestowed by knightly accolade thereafter the army and the country with a fanciful play upon the initials of his name spoke of him as unconditional surrender grant buckner had no other balm for the sting of his defeat than to say that grant's terms were ungenerous and unchivalric but that necessity compelled him to accept them that day grant was enabled to telegraph to halleck quote, we have taken fort donelson and from twelve thousand to fifteen thousand prisoners including generals buckner and bushrod r johnson also about twenty thousand stands of arms forty-eight pieces of artillery seventeen heavy guns from two thousand to four thousand horses and large quantities of commissary stores End quote. by this brilliant and important victory grant's fame sprang suddenly into full and universal recognition president lincoln nominated him major general of volunteers and the senate at once confirmed the appointment the whole military service felt the inspiriting event Many of the colonels in Grant's army were made brigadier generals, and promotion ran like a quickening leaven through the whole organization. Halleck also reminded the government of his desire for larger power. Quote, Make Buell, Grant, and Pope major generals of volunteers, he telegraphed the day after the surrender, and give me command in the West. I ask this in return for Forts Henry and Donelson. End, quote. End of chapter 11 Recording by Owen Cook in Pottawatomi, Ceded Land. Chapter 12 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay compensated abolishment the annual message of president lincoln at the opening of congress in december eighteen sixty one treated many subjects of importance foreign relations the condition of the finances a reorganization of the supreme court questions of military administration the building of a military railroad through kentucky to east tennessee the newly organized territories a review of military progress towards the suppression of rebellion it contained also a vigorous practical discussion of the relations between capital and labor which pointed out with singular force that the insurrection is largely if not exclusively a war upon the first principle of popular government the rights of the people in addition to these topics it treated another question of greater importance than all of them but in so moderate a tone and with such tentative suggestions that it excited less immediate comment than any other this was the question of slavery it had not escaped mr lincoln's notice that the relations of slavery to the war were producing rapidly increasing complications and moulding public thought to new and radical changes of opinion his revocation of fremont's proclamation had momentarily checked the clamor of importunate agitators for military emancipation but he saw clearly enough that a deep though as yet undefined public hope clung to the vague suggestion that slavery and rebellion might perish together as a significant symptom of this undercurrent of feeling there came to him in november a letter from george bancroft the veteran democratic politician and national historian a man eminent not only for his writings upon the science of government but who as a member of president polk's cabinet had rendered signal and lasting service in national administration mr bancroft had lately presided at a meeting in new york called to collect contributions to aid the suffering loyalists of north carolina as it happened on all such occasions the patriotism of the hour sprang forward to bold speech and radical argument even the moderate words of mr bancroft on taking the chair reflected this reformatory spirit if slavery and the union are incompatible listen to the words that come to you from the tomb of andrew jackson 
the union must be preserved at all hazards if any one claims the compromises of the constitution let him begin by placing the constitution in power by respecting it and upholding it in the letter transmitting these remarks and the resolutions of the meeting to mr lincoln mr bancroft made a yet more emphatic suggestion he wrote your administration has fallen upon times which will be remembered as long as human events find a record i sincerely wish to you the glory of perfect success civil war is the instrument of divine providence to root out social slavery posterity will not be satisfied with the result unless the consequences of the war shall effect an increase of free states this is the universal expectation and hope of men of all parties such a letter from a man having the learning talent and political standing of its author is of itself historic but mr lincoln's reply gives it a special significance november eighteenth eighteen sixty one he wrote i esteem it a high honor to have received a note from mr bancroft enclosing the report of proceedings of a new york meeting taking measures for the relief of union people of north carolina i thank you and all others participating for this benevolent and patriotic movement the main thought in the closing paragraph of your letter is one which does not escape my attention and with which i must deal in all due caution and with the best judgment i can bring to it this language gives us the exact condition of mr lincoln's mind on the subject of slavery at that time he hoped and expected to effect an increase of free states through emancipation but we shall see that this emancipation was to come through the voluntary action of the states and that he desired by such policy to render unnecessary the compulsory military enfranchisement which fremont had attempted and which his followers advocated the caution and good judgment which president lincoln applied to the solution of this dangerous problem become manifest when we re-examine its treatment in his annual message mentioned above not referring directly to any general plan or hope of emancipation he nevertheless approached the subject by discussing its immediate and practical necessities in phraseology which gave him room for expansion into a more decisive policy it is worth while not merely to quote the whole passage but to emphasize the sentences which were plainly designed to lead congress and the country to the contemplation of new and possible contingencies under and by virtue of the act of congress entitled an act to confiscate property used for insurrectionary purposes approved august sixth eighteen sixty one the legal claims of certain persons to the labor and service of certain other persons have become forfeited and numbers of the latter thus liberated are already dependent on the united states and must be provided for in some way besides this it is not impossible that some of the states will pass similar enactments for their own benefit respectively and by operation of which persons of the same class will be thrown upon them for disposal in such case i recommend that congress provide for accepting such persons from such states according to some mode of valuation in lieu pro tanto of direct taxes or upon some other plan to be agreed on with such states respectively that such persons on such acceptance by the general government be at once deemed free and that in any event steps be taken for colonizing both classes or the one first mentioned if the other shall not be brought into existence at some place or places in a climate congenial to them it might be well to consider too whether the free colored people already in the united states could not so far as individuals may desire be included in such colonization 
the war continues in considering the policy to be adopted for suppressing the insurrection i have been anxious and careful that the inevitable conflict for this purpose shall not degenerate into a violent and remorseless revolutionary struggle i have therefore in every case thought it proper to keep the integrity of the union prominent as the primary object of the contest on our part leaving all questions which are not of vital military importance to the more deliberate action of the legislature in the exercise of my best discretion i have adhered to the blockade of the ports held by the insurgents instead of putting in force by proclamation the law of congress enacted at the late session for closing those ports so also obeying the dictates of prudence as well as the obligations of law instead of transcending i have adhered to the act of congress to confiscate property used for insurrectionary purposes if a new law upon the same subject shall be proposed its propriety will be duly considered the union must be preserved and hence all indispensable means must be employed we should not be in haste to determine that radical and extreme measures which may reach the loyal as well as the disloyal are indispensable apparently these propositions covered the simple recommendation of colonization an old and familiar topic which had friends in both free and slave states but the language when closely scanned is full of novel suggestions that the war has already freed many slaves that the war may free many more that the president will impartially consider any new law of congress increasing emancipation for rebellion that he will not hastily adopt extreme measures but that finally to preserve the union all indispensable means must be employed these declarations in fact cover the whole of his subsequent treatment of the slavery question congress was too busy with pressing practical legislation to find time for immediately elaborating by debate or enactment any of the recommendations thus made it is not likely that the president expected early action from the national legislature for he at once turned his own attention to certain initiatory efforts which he had probably carefully meditated he believed that under the pressure of war necessities the border slave states might be induced to take up the idea of voluntary emancipation if the general government would pay their citizens the full property value of the slaves they were asked to liberate and this experiment seemed to him most feasible in the small state of delaware which retained only the merest fragment of a property interest in the peculiar institution owing to the division of its voters between breckinridge bell lincoln and douglas the electoral vote of delaware had been cast for breckinridge in the presidential election of eighteen sixty but more adroit party management had succeeded in effecting a fusion of the bell and lincoln vote for member of congress and george p fisher had been elected by a small majority it is of little importance to know the exact shade of mr fisher's politics during the campaign when the rebellion broke out he was an ardent unionist a steadfast friend of mr lincoln and perhaps more liberal on the subject of slavery than any other border state representative he entered readily into mr lincoln's views and plans which were to induce the legislature of delaware to pass an act of gradual emancipation of the one thousand seven hundred and ninety eight slaves which it contained by the census of eighteen sixty on condition that the united states will pay to delaware to be distributed among its slave owners in proper ratio the sum of four hundred dollars for each slave or a total of seven hundred and nineteen thousand two hundred dollars mr lincoln during the month of november had with his own hand written drafts of two separate bills embracing the principal details of the scheme by the first all negroes in delaware above the age of thirty-five years should become free on the passage of the act all born after its passage should remain free and all others after suitable apprenticeship for children should become free in the year eighteen ninety three 
also that the state should meanwhile prevent any of its slaves being sold into servitude elsewhere the provisions of the second draft were slightly different lincoln's manuscript explains on reflection i like number two the better by it the nation would pay the state twenty three thousand two hundred dollars per annum for thirty one years all born after the passage of the act would be born free all slaves above the age of thirty-five years would become free on the passage of the act all others would become free on arriving at the age of thirty-five years until january eighteen ninety three when all remaining of all ages would become free subject to apprenticeship for minors born of slave mothers up to the respective ages of twenty-one and eighteen upon consultation with the president mr fisher undertook to propose and commend the scheme to his influential party friends in delaware and if possible to induce the legislature of that state to adopt it one of the drafts prepared by mr lincoln was rewritten by the friends of the measure in delaware embodying the necessary details to give it proper force and local application to become a law of that state in this shape it was printed and circulated among the members of the legislature then holding a special session at dover the legislature of delaware was not a large body nine members of the senate and twenty-one members of the house constituted the whole number we have no record of the discussions formal or informal which the proposition called forth the final action however indicates the sentiment which prevailed the friends of emancipation probably ascertained that a hostile majority would vote it down therefore the laboriously prepared bill was never introduced the pro-slavery members unwilling to lose the opportunity of airing their conservatism immediately prepared a joint resolution reciting the bill at full length and then loading it with the strongest phrases of condemnation which their party zeal could invent they said it would encourage the abolition element in congress that it evinced a design to abolish slavery in the states that congress had no right to appropriate a dollar for the purchase of slaves that they were unwilling to make delaware guarantee the public faith of the united states that when the people of delaware desired to abolish slavery within her borders they would do so in their way and intimated that the suggestions of saving expense to the people were a bribe which they scornfully repelled a majority of the twenty-one members of the house passed this joint resolution but when it came to the senate on the seventh of february four of its nine members voted aye four voted no and one was silent or absent and so the joint resolution went back non concurred in this seems to have closed the legislative record on the subject mr lincoln was doubtless disappointed at the failure to give his plan of compensated gradual abolishment a starting point by the favorable action of the state of delaware by the favorable action of the state of delaware but he did not abandon the project and his next step was to bring it through congress to the attention of the country and the states interested on the sixth of march he sent to the senate and the house of representatives a special message recommending the adoption of the following joint resolution resolved that the united states ought to cooperate with any state which may adopt gradual abolishment of slavery giving to such state pecuniary aid to be used by such state in its discretion to compensate for the inconveniences public and private produced by such change of system his message explained that this was merely the proposal of practical measures which he hoped would follow he said the point is not that all the states tolerating slavery would very soon if at all initiate emancipation but that while the offer is equally made to all the more northern shall by such initiation make it certain to the more southern that in no event will the former ever join the latter in their proposed confederacy i say initiation because in my judgment gradual and not sudden emancipation is better for all 
such a proposition on the part of the general government sets up no claim of a right by federal authority to interfere with slavery within state limits referring as it does the absolute control of the subject in each case to the state and its people immediately interested it is proposed as a matter of perfectly free choice with them in the annual message last december i thought fit to say the union must be preserved and hence all indispensable means must be employed i said this not hastily but deliberately war has been made and continues to be an indispensable means to this end a practical re-acknowledgment of the national authority would render the war unnecessary and it would at once cease if however resistance continues the war must also continue and it is impossible to foresee all the incidents which may attend and all the ruin which may follow it such as may seem indispensable or may obviously promise great efficiency towards ending the struggle must and will come to this public recommendation he added some cogent reasons in private letters to influential persons thus three days after his message he wrote to the editor of the new york times i am grateful to the new york journals and not less so to the times than to others for their kind notices of the late special message to congress your paper however intimates that the proposition though well-intentioned must fail on the score of expense i do hope you will reconsider this have you noticed the facts that less than one half day's cost of this war would pay for all the slaves in delaware at four hundred dollars per head that eighty-seven days cost of this war would pay for all in delaware maryland district of columbia kentucky and missouri at the same price were those states to take the step do you doubt that it would shorten the war more than eighty-seven days and thus be an actual saving of expense please look at these things and consider whether there should not be another article in the times so again to senator mcdougall who was opposing the scheme with considerable earnestness in the senate he wrote privately on march fourteen as to the expensiveness of the plan of gradual emancipation with compensation proposed in the late message please allow me one or two brief suggestions less than one half day's cost of this war would pay for all the slaves in delaware at four hundred dollars per head thus all the slaves in delaware by the census of eighteen sixty are one thousand seven hundred and ninety eight times four hundred dollars the cost of the slave seven hundred and nineteen thousand two hundred dollars one day's cost of the war two million dollars again less than eighty-seven days cost of this war would at the same price pay for all in delaware maryland district of columbia kentucky and missouri thus slaves in delaware one thousand seven hundred and ninety eight slaves in maryland eighty seven thousand one hundred and eighty eight slaves in district of columbia three thousand one hundred and eighty one slaves in kentucky two hundred and twenty five thousand four hundred and ninety slaves in missouri one hundred and fourteen thousand nine hundred and sixty five total four hundred and thirty two thousand six hundred and twenty two times four hundred dollars cost of slaves one hundred and seventy three million forty eight thousand eight hundred dollars eighty seven days cost of the war one hundred and seventy four million dollars do you doubt that taking the initiatory steps on the part of those states and this district would shorten the war more than eighty seven days and thus be an actual saving of expense a word as to the time and manner of incurring the expense suppose for instance a state devises and adopts a system by which the institution absolutely ceases therein by a name day say january one eighteen eighty two then let the sum to be paid to such state by the united states be ascertained by taking from the census of eighteen sixty the number of slaves within the state and multiplying that number by four hundred the united states to pay such sum to the state in twenty equal annual installments in six per cent bonds of the united states 
the sum thus given as to time and manner i think would not be half as onerous as would be an equal sum raised now for the indefinite prosecution of the war but of this you can judge as well as i it was between the dates of these letters that president lincoln made the most important personal effort to secure favorable action on his project of gradual abolishment at his request such members of congress from the border slave states of delaware maryland west virginia kentucky and missouri as were present in washington came in a body to the executive mansion on march ten where a somewhat prolonged discussion of this subject ensued the substance of which was authentically reported by them in reading the account of the interview it must be remembered that lincoln was addressing the representatives of such slave states as had remained loyal and his phrases respecting his attitude and intention towards slavery were not intended by him to apply to the states whose persistent rebellion had forfeited the consideration and rights which the others could justly claim mr crisfield thus relates the substance of the president's address after the usual salutations and we were seated the president said in substance that he had invited us to meet him to have some conversation with us in explanation of his message of the sixth that since he had sent it in several of the gentlemen then present had visited him but had avoided any allusion to the message and he therefore inferred that the import of the message had been misunderstood and was regarded as inimical to the interests we represented and he had resolved he would talk with us and disabuse our minds of that erroneous opinion the president then disclaimed any intent to injure the interests or wound the sensibilities of the slave states on the contrary his purpose was to protect the one and respect the other that we were engaged in a terrible wasting and tedious war immense armies were in the field and must continue in the field as long as the war lasts that these armies must of necessity be brought into contact with slaves in the states we represented and in other states as they advanced that slaves would come to the camps and continual irritation was kept up that he was constantly annoyed by conflicting and antagonistic complaints on the one side a certain class complained if the slave was not protected by the army persons were frequently found who participating in these views acted in a way unfriendly to the slaveholder on the other hand slaveholders complained that their rights were interfered with their slaves induced to abscond and protected within the lines these complaints were numerous loud and deep were a serious annoyance to him and embarrassing to the progress of the war that it kept alive a spirit hostile to the government in the states we represented strengthened the hopes of the confederates that at some day the border states would unite with them and thus tend to prolong the war and he was of the opinion if this resolution should be adopted by congress and accepted by our states these causes of irritation and these hopes would be removed and more would be accomplished towards shortening the war than could be hoped from the greatest victory achieved by union armies that he made this proposition in good faith and desired it to be accepted if at all voluntarily and in the same patriotic spirit in which it was made that emancipation was a subject exclusively under the control of the states and must be adopted or rejected by each for itself that he did not claim nor had this government any right to coerce them for that purpose that such was no part of his purpose in making this proposition and he wished it to be clearly understood that he did not expect us there to be prepared to give him an answer but he hoped we would take the subject into serious consideration confer with one another and then take such course as we felt our duty and the interests of our constituents required of us it is not to be wondered at that his auditors were unable to give him affirmative replies or even remote encouragement representing slave-holding constituencies their natural attitude was one of unyielding conservatism their whole tone was one of doubt of qualified protest and of apprehensive inquiry 
they had not failed to note that in his annual message of december three and his special message of march six he had announced his determination to use all indispensable means to preserve the union and had hinted that necessity might force him to employ extreme measures and one of them asked pointedly if the president looked to any policy beyond the acceptance or rejection of this scheme his answer was frank and direct mr crisfield of maryland writes the president replied that he had no designs beyond the action of the states on this particular subject he should lament their refusal to accept it but he had no designs beyond their refusal of it unless he was expelled by the act of god or the confederate armies he should occupy that house for three years and as long as he remained there maryland had nothing to fear either for her institutions or her interests on the points referred to the day on which this interview was held roscoe conkling introduced into the house of representatives the exact joint resolution which the president had recommended in his message of the sixth and debate on the subject was begun the discussion showed a wide divergence of views among representatives moderate republicans generally supported the resolution even pronounced anti-slavery men such as lovejoy in the house and sumner in the senate indicated their willingness to join in the liberal compensation the president had proposed if the loyal slave states would consent to relinquish their portion of the disturbing and dangerous evil since it was not a practical measure but simply an announcement of policy the opposition was not strenuous a few border state representatives and the more obstinate democrats from free states joined in a somewhat ill-natured dissent the resolution was passed on the following day yeas eighty nine nays thirty one the action of the senate was very similar though the debate was a little more delayed the resolution was passed in that body april two yeas thirty two nays ten and received the president's signature on the tenth of april eighteen sixty two by his initiative and influence mr lincoln thus committed the executive and legislative departments of the government to the policy of compensated emancipation and there is no doubt that had his generous offer been accepted by the border states within a reasonable time the pledge embodied in the joint resolution would have been promptly redeemed though it afterwards turned out that this action remained only sentimental and prospective it nevertheless had no inconsiderable effect in bringing to pass a very important practical measure in its long contest for political supremacy slavery had clung with unyielding tenacity to its foothold in the district of columbia where it had been the most irritating eyesore to northern opinion whatever might be conceded to the doctrine of state sovereignty anti-slavery men felt that the peculiar institution had no claim to the exclusive shelter of the federal flag on the other hand pro-slavery men saw that to relinquish this claim would be fatal to their determination to push it to national recognition hence the abolition or the maintenance of slavery in the district of columbia had become a frequent issue in party politics the prohibition of the slave trade in the district was indeed effected in the great compromise of eighteen fifty but this concession was more than counterbalanced by the pro-slavery gains of that political bargain and since then the abolition of slavery itself in this central federal jurisdiction seemed to have become impossible until rebellion provoked the change under the new conditions anti-slavery zeal was pushing its lance into every joint of the monster's armor and this vulnerable point was not overlooked the constitution placed the district of columbia exclusively under the legislation of congress and by their rebellious withdrawal from their seats in the two houses the southern senators and representatives had voluntarily surrendered this citadel of their propagandism president lincoln had not specifically recommended abolishment in the district in his annual message but he had introduced a bill for such a purpose when he was a member of congress in eighteen forty nine 
and it was well known that his views had undergone no change later on the already recited special message of march sixth embraced the subject in its larger aspects and recommendations thus with perfect knowledge that it would receive executive sanction the senate on april three yeas twenty nine nays fourteen and the house on april eleven yeas ninety two nays thirty eight passed an act of immediate emancipation of the slaves in the district of columbia with compensation to the owners to be distributed by a commission the whole not to exceed an aggregate of three hundred dollars per slave the act also appropriated the sum of one hundred thousand dollars for expenses of a voluntary emigration to haiti or liberia president lincoln signed the act on the sixteenth of april and in his short message of approval said i have never doubted the constitutional authority of congress to abolish slavery in this district and i have ever desired to see the national capital freed from the institution in some satisfactory way hence there has never been in my mind any question upon the subject except the one of expediency arising in view of all the circumstances i am gratified that the two principles of compensation and colonization are both recognized and practically applied in the act certain omissions in the law which the president pointed out were remedied by supplementary enactments which among other provisions added to the boon of freedom the privilege of education by opening public schools to colored children End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay monitor and merrimac in a great war such as that of the rebellion an inventive people like the americans could not fail to originate novelties and develop progress in methods of fighting the most critical point of the contest on both sides was the possibility of foreign intervention this compelled the north to find effective means to enforce the long and difficult sea-coast blockade while for the south it constituted a prime object to break it both sides therefore turned eagerly to experiments in the new system of iron-clad ships in the destruction of the gosport navy yard at the outbreak of the war the united states steam frigate merrimac was burned to the water's edge and sunk the rebels soon raised her and finding her hull undamaged and the engines yet serviceable they proceeded by help of the tredegar ironworks at richmond to convert her into an ironclad a wedge-shaped prow of cast iron weighing one thousand five hundred pounds was fastened to the stem two feet under water and projecting about two feet in front a roof of wood two feet thick with its sides inclining at thirty-six degrees to the water's edge was made to cover about two-thirds of the hull being the central part this was plated with iron armor composed of two plates each two inches thick within this protection was placed a battery of ten guns four on each broadside and one each at the stem and stern the navy department at washington was no less prompt to study the question of ironclads the special session of congress appropriated one and a half million of dollars for the work a public advertisement invited plans and offers of construction a competent board of naval officers examined the devices presented and recommended three of the most promising which by way of trial were put under contract our immediate demands said their report seem to require first so far as practicable vessels invulnerable to shot of light draught of water to penetrate our shoal harbors rivers and bayous of the three plans adopted the one presented by john erickson of new york a swede by birth but an american citizen by adoption a man of original genius of great scientific acquirements and of long experience in engineering service 
proved in the end to conform best to these requirements the board had doubts of its sea-going qualities but at once recognized it as a plan which will render the battery shot and shell proof the hull one hundred and twenty seven feet long thirty six feet wide and twelve feet deep was covered by a flat overhanging deck slightly wider but much longer pointed at both ends closed and made water tight and rising only one or two feet above the water line on this stood a revolving turret twenty feet in diameter and nine feet high composed of wrought iron plates bolted together to a total thickness of eight inches inside this were two eleven-inch dahlgren guns trained side by side and revolving with the turret ericsson named his novel ship the monitor when public humor afterwards christened his invention by calling it a cheese box on a raft the designation expressed the exact intention of his model in observing the movements of timber rafts down the norwegian coast he had noticed that they suffered no danger from the waves which simply rolled over them so the closed platform of the monitor which would permit the waves to roll freely over its surface required only its comparatively thin edge above and below the water-line to be protected with heavy iron armour by this clever device weight which is the main difficulty in armoured ships was reduced to a minimum and enabled him to combine great thickness of mail with the utmost lightness of draught information concerning the progress of the work on these first american ironclads reached both belligerents the officers at fort monroe reported in october eighteen sixty one that the merrimac she was named the virginia by the rebels would probably make an effort to get to sea this proved a premature rumor late in the following february the navy department had more trustworthy information through a union mechanic then at work upon her that she was nearly finished the rebels doubtless had similar information concerning the ironclads building at the north but in each case such clandestine knowledge was necessarily vague and fragmentary enough however was known in washington to make it probable that the merrimac would prove formidable in a naval contest delay had occurred in the work on the union ironclads the time of their possible presence there could not be fixed with certainty and their ability to meet such an antagonist was purely a matter of speculation when the monitor was recommended by the naval board and put under contract even the most experienced and most sanguine officers had no expectation of the remarkable fighting powers she afterwards demonstrated on thursday night the sixth of march eighteen sixty two the assistant secretary of the navy was called to a council of war then being held at the executive mansion at which the president cabinet and various military officers were present the peninsular campaign had been substantially agreed upon but its details were yet under discussion president lincoln once more explained that taking the whole army first to annapolis to be embarked in transports would appear to the extremely sensitive and impatient public opinion very much like a retreat from washington it would be impolitic to explain that it was merely a first step by way of the chesapeake bay and fort monroe towards richmond could not he asked fifty thousand or even ten thousand men be moved in transports directly down the potomac this would be a self-evident forward movement which the public would comprehend without explanation the objection was that transports could not safely pass existing rebel batteries on the potomac could not the navy destroy those batteries assistant secretary fox replied that the navy could silence the batteries but that unless held by our army they would immediately be reoccupied rebuilt and again armed and manned by the rebels and we needed a prolonged not a temporary respite the army officers objected that to occupy hold and defend those batteries from land attacks would produce a local and partial movement and diversion only to cripple and delay the main and distant expedition 
lincoln finally decided that the navy should in any event engage and silence the potomac batteries even if only for a temporary and moral effect there being as yet no telegraph to fort monroe orders were transmitted by sea directing that certain ships of war and the monitor which that day sailed from new york should ascend the potomac for this duty the merrimac was for the moment forgotten but being remembered next day supplementary orders were sent directing a suspension of action till assistant secretary fox could visit fort monroe and consult the naval officers in command when he arrived there on sunday morning an important naval engagement had occurred the renewal and conclusion of which he witnessed three union frigates lay at anchor under the guns of fort monroe and two others under the guns of the union earthworks near newport news six miles to the southwest when on saturday march eight about noon the merrimac appeared in the mouth of the elizabeth river channel which enters hampton roads about midway between the points named above and headed directly for newport news she was accompanied by two small tugs armed with one gun each while three other side-wheel steamers out of the james river respectively of one two and twelve guns also joined the merrimac after the attack the ships at fort monroe immediately slipped their cables and started for the encounter following the merrimac towards the southwest the minnesota twin ship to the original merrimac under steam the st lawrence sailing frigate in tow of a gunboat and the roanoke with a broken shaft towed by tugs but owing to a recent northwest gale water was low in the channel and all of these vessels being of deep draught soon grounded the minnesota north of the middle ground one and a half miles from newport news the st lawrence near her and the roanoke still farther behind beyond an occasional exchange of fire at long distances they were therefore unable to join in the main fight the sailing frigate congress and the razid frigate cumberland anchored at newport news saw the merrimac coming and prepared for action ploughing up the bay with her sloping roof and her low prow she looked to them like a huge half-submerged crocodile her warning shot was given when yet a mile away exchanging a broadside with the congress as she passed her at the distance of three hundred yards she rushed full speed at the cumberland which had opened on her with her pivot guns and now greeted her with broadsides as she neared but neither the broadsides of the wooden ships nor the fire of the shore batteries had any apparent effect the showering iron hail glanced and bounded from the sloping tortoise-shaped back of the leviathan-like india rubber balls on and on she came with accelerated momentum till within fifteen minutes after the first shot was fired she struck the cumberland forward of the starboard fore chains the crash of her iron prow through the timbers and hull was distinctly heard above the din of battle the attacked vessel was forced back upon her anchors with great violence and a hole the size of a hogshead was opened in the hull into which the water rushed in a deluge pumps were of no avail against such a flood and the good ship was doomed and besides this the shells of her iron-cased destroyer were spreading death on her decks as she backed away but yet hovered over her victim at convenient nearness her guns continued to belch forth irresistible havoc history records no more determined bravery than was displayed by the officers and crew of the cumberland neither present disaster nor impending danger checked their devoted heroism with men cut down at their guns and the ship settling to her fate under their feet they answered broadside with broadside shot with shot when the water in the hold rose and drowned the forward magazine they still passed up powder from the one aft the last gun was fired when the sea was already running into the muzzle of the gun beside it after three-quarters of an hour of such fighting the gallant ship with the dead and wounded of her crew and some even of her heroic defenders who clung doggedly to their posts after orders had been given to save themselves went to the bottom in fifty feet of water with the stars and stripes still flying from her masthead 
her antagonist did not come from the encounter entirely unharmed the blow which sunk the cumberland wrenched off her iron prow and slightly twisted her stem the cumberland's solid shot broke the muzzles of two of her guns and killed two of her men wounding nineteen others ebb tide having begun the merrimac steamed a short distance upstream to turn and then attacked the congress which lay several hundred yards east of the cumberland the congress seeing the fate of her companion slipped her cable and by using her sails and with the help of a tug ran ashore and grounded where the iron monster could not follow but the precaution was futile the merrimac returning took up a raking position off her quarter at two cables length soon silenced the few guns that bore upon her and after an hour's fight creating frightful carnage the commander having been killed and the ship set on fire in several places the congress struck her colors confederate officers charge that fire was again opened from the congress after surrender which union officers deny the conflict of assertion is probably explained by the circumstance that fire was opened upon the rebel boats from the shore with both cannon and musketry a proceeding perfectly justifiable by the laws of war the event caused the merrimac to open once more on the congress with hot shot and incendiary shells and whether from these or other causes she burned till midnight when the explosion of her magazine ended the conflagration the merrimac with her consorts withdrew from the field of conflict firing at both the minnesota and st lawrence as they passed down the channel at the distance of a mile but the merrimac offered no serious attack probably expecting to capture them the following day at nightfall the rebel flotilla anchored under the guns of their shore batteries on sewell's point at the entrance of the channel to norfolk whence they had come among the union commanders the gloomy disasters of the afternoon were heightened by the seemingly hopeless apprehension for the morrow with great difficulty the tugs had hauled the roanoke and st lawrence back to fort monroe the minnesota was hard aground but what ship ashore or afloat could stand before this new and terrible marine engine that moved unharmed through the repeated broadsides of the most powerful naval armaments telegraphic news of these events reached washington the next morning sunday and the hasty meeting of the cabinet and other officials who immediately gathered at the white house was perhaps the most excited and impressive of the whole war stanton unable to control his strong emotion walked up and down the room like a caged lion mcclellan was dumbfounded and silent lincoln was as usual in trying moments composed but eagerly inquisitive critically scanning the dispatches interrogating the officers joining scrap to scrap of information applying his searching analysis and clear logic to read the danger and find the remedy chase impatient and ready to utter blame seward and wells hopeful yet without encouraging reasons to justify their hope the possibilities of the hour were indeed sufficiently portentous to create consternation what might not this new and irresistible leviathan of the deep accomplish a fleet destroyed fort monroe besieged the blockade broken the richmond campaign thwarted new york laid under contribution washington city and the public buildings burned and the government in flight foreign intervention would surely follow a succession of events like these which heated imagination easily called up even at the risk of creating a momentary panic it seemed necessary to warn the authorities of the seaboard cities to prepare all possible resources of their own for defence the best available provision to make washington city secure that could be suggested was to prepare and load barges and canal boats to be sunk in the channel of the potomac at kettle bottom shoals and other points quartermaster general meigs and captain dahlgren were charged by the secretary of war with this duty since guns were of no avail against the merrimac it was decided to have recourse to her own process of ramming for this purpose the strongest and swiftest merchant steamer in new york 
the vanderbilt was chartered strengthened by filling her bow with timbers and plating it outside with iron and sent to fort monroe under orders to try to run down her antagonist at the first opportunity and at whatever risk but more effective help had arrived and even while these councils were in progress was bringing the question to a practical solution by the light of the burning congress on saturday night a rebel pilot saw a strange craft glide into the waters of hampton roads it was the monitor which safely towed from new york arrived between nine and ten o'clock so little was the new system and model in favor that the older officers of the navy had generally condemned it in advance and manifested no ambition to command her lieutenant john l worden however had accepted the duty and was immediately informed that a critical trial was at hand a little after midnight he moved to a station near the minnesota which was still aground on sunday morning march nine the merrimac once more came out and steamed towards the minnesota with the expectation of easily capturing or destroying her but as she approached the monitor went out to meet her the contrast was that of a pygmy to a giant the merrimac was twice her length and breadth had more than four times her displacement and five times as many guns but her great draught twenty-two feet confined her manoeuvres to deep water while the monitor drawing only ten feet could run where she pleased the huge tortoise back of the merrimac was an easy target while her broadsides passed harmlessly over the low flat deck of the monitor only one or two feet above water the shore spectators now witnessed a prolonged and exciting naval duel the small rebel gunboats withdrew the merrimac occasionally exchanged fire with the minnesota but her principal fight was with the monitor the two ironclads moved fearlessly towards each other firing as favorable opportunity offered but the nine inch and eleven inch shells glanced without effect alike from the sloping roof of the merrimac and the round side of the monitor's tower the superior mobility of the latter proved a great advantage she and her turret says the rebel commander appeared to be under perfect control her light draught enabled her to move about us at pleasure she once took position for a short time where we could not bring a gun to bear on her another of her movements caused us great anxiety she made for our rudder and propeller both of which could have been easily disabled we could only see her guns when they were discharged immediately afterwards the turret revolved rapidly and the guns were not again seen until they were again fired when we saw that our fire made no impression on the monitor we determined to run into her if possible we found it a very difficult feat to do our great length and draught in a comparatively narrow channel with but little water to spare made us sluggish in our movements and hard to steer and turn when the opportunity presented all steam was put on there was not however sufficient time to gather full headway before striking the blow was given with the broad wooden stem the iron prow having been lost the day before the monitor received the blow in such a manner as to weaken its effect and the damage was to her trifling three hours passed in this singular contest the monitor had fired forty-one shots she inflicted no direct damage neither did she receive any on both sides the shells only made slight indentations in the thick iron armor yet it was apparent to the rebel officers that the little cheese-box on a raft was gradually wearing out her bulky antagonist it became evident that if the merrimac were by accident struck twice in the same place her shield would be penetrated she was already leaking badly her loss of prow anchor and consumption of coal was raising her so as dangerously to expose her water-line where the iron plating was only one inch thick a chance shot here would send her to the bottom but at this time the monitor met with a serious accident 
her pilot-house was constructed of great iron logs nine by twelve inches thick laid up after the manner of a log cabin leaving spaces of half an inch between them through which to observe the enemy and steer the ship lieutenant worden the commander was standing in this pilot-house giving orders when one of the merrimac's shells struck the outside of the logs between which he was looking the concussion drove the smoke and iron dust through with such force as temporarily to blind him disabling him from command and causing a short suspension of all guidance of the monitor until he could be properly cared for when however after the lapse of some twenty minutes lieutenant green the second officer who had by worden's direction assumed command turned his vessel again to face his antagonist he saw that the merrimac had already started in the direction of elizabeth river he fired a few shots after her but she continued her retreat refusing further combat if as the rebel commander states the merrimac was yet willing to have continued the fight she was equally ready to consent to its cessation making no further effort to shell the minnesota which still lay aground within easy reach of her guns she quit the waters of hampton roads at noon three hours before high water and steamed back to norfolk whence she had come in reality the contest had been decided by the evident prospective superiority of the monitor rather than by any present necessity of either combatant counted merely by blows received and given it was a drawn battle but practically a victory which seemed providential in its sudden relief and immense results remained with the monitor the whole event was even still broader in its effect that three hours battle in hampton roads changed the naval warfare of the civilized world a quarter of a century has elapsed and still the great powers of europe are testing the yet unsolved problem of the largest gun to destroy and the strongest armor to protect a ship of war the welcome news reached the washington authorities that same night by the newly laid telegraph changing deep anxiety into lively exultation lincoln always prudent at once saw clearly the immense value of the monitor's victory and resolved it should not be placed in jeopardy he therefore sent orders that she should not be unduly exposed and that on no account should she attempt to go to norfolk alone the preparations for blocking the potomac channel were completed and held in constant readiness and several additional swift merchant vessels were soon after stationed at fort monroe to make the destruction of the merrimac reasonably sure by running her down it turned out that she was never in a condition to go to sea and that her great draft prevented her ascending the potomac after the peninsular campaign was begun there was always an immense number of union transports in the adjacent waters to which she could have done incalculable damage for about two months she thus remained a vague terror though the menace was effectually neutralized by the monitor and the merchant war vessels assembled in triple and quadruple force to oppose and annihilate her on her part the merrimac profited by the blockade to which she was subjected by being repaired and much strengthened by a new steel and wrought iron prow by iron plating on her hull and improved ammunition on the eleventh of april she descended again to hampton roads in company with three rebel gunboats and nine small tugs but beyond getting the various unarmed vessels out of the way the union fleet made no movement for its orders provided that the monitor and other vessels should not be separated but that if the merrimac came out into favorable waters they should all go at her the position is one of defiance on both sides wrote a newspaper correspondent the rebels are challenging us to come up to their field of battle and we are daring them to come down the union fleet understood too well its primary duty of keeping the merrimac from any possibility of reaching the army transports in york river while on their part the rebel officers were also restrained by orders to remain for the protection of norfolk no battle grew out of this game of strategy and at night the rebel vessels withdrew we must anticipate somewhat the chronological order of events to bring within the present chapter the final fate of both the monitor and merrimac 
in the progress of the peninsular campaign when the confederates found mcclellan's army advancing against richmond in such powerful numbers it became necessary to draw in all available detachments for the defence of their capital and on the first of may the evacuation of norfolk was determined upon on the fourth of may the merrimac was ordered to take station where she could prevent the union forces from ascending the james river huger the rebel military commander however obtained a postponement of this duty till his preparations for evacuation should be further advanced it happened by a curious coincidence that president lincoln secretary chase and secretary stanton started in the evening of the fifth of may for a visit to fort monroe so far as is known it had only a general object to ascertain by personal observation whether some further vigilance and vigor might not be infused into the operations of the army and navy at that point delayed by bad weather on the potomac they arrived at their destination on tuesday night may sixth late as it was they immediately proceeded to the steamship minnesota and held a conference with commodore l m goldsborough the flag officer about the condition of things and military and naval movements in connection with the dreaded merrimac next day may seven the party visited the various places of interest the vanderbilt the monitor the ruined village of hampton the rip raps and fort monroe with doubtless a running council of war among themselves and the naval and military commanders for two important orders appear to have been given by the president that same wednesday evening preparations for executing which were made during the night in pursuance of these orders on the morning of thursday may eighth the new ironclad galena with two other gunboats were sent up the james river and a considerable section of the remaining fleet moved across the waters of the bay to an attack on the confederate sewell's point batteries this was a reconnaissance in force troops were already embarked in transports to push across and effect a landing if it appeared practicable with a view to advance on norfolk but the cannonade from the ships called forth a spirited reply from the rebel batteries on sewell's point and after a while the merrimac appeared to take part in the fray all the big wooden vessels writes chase who with lincoln and stanton witnessed the bombardment from the rip-raps began to haul off the monitor and stevens however held their ground the merrimac still came on slowly and in a little while there was a clear sheet of water between her and the monitor then the great rebel terror paused then turned back and having finally attained what she considered a safe position became stationary again that was thought to have shown the inability of an attempt to land at sewell's point while the merrimac lay watching it says chase in another letter and the troops were disembarked from the transports but all this commotion had stirred up inquiry and elicited information and a pilot suggested that a landing might be found to the eastward beyond willoughby point against the general incredulity of the officers chase on friday morning may nine took the revenue cutter miami on which the party had come from washington and a tug and went on a reconnaissance to the shore indicated here some five or six miles from fort monroe soundings disclosed a feasible landing undefended by batteries or even pickets and a boat sent ashore obtained valuable information of passable roads leading to norfolk when i got back to fort monroe continues chase i found the president had been listening to a pilot and studying a chart and had become impressed with the conviction that there was a nearer landing and wished to go and see about it on the spot so we started again and soon reached the shore taking with us a large boat and some twenty armed soldiers from the rip-raps the president and mr stanton were on the tug and i on the miami the tug was of course near shore and as soon as she found the water too shoal for her to go farther safely the rip-raps boat was manned and sent in we had again found a good landing which at the time i supposed to be between two and three miles nearer fort monroe but which proved to be only one-half or three-quarters of a mile nearer 
it is probable that these opportune discoveries were supplemented by other important information on the previous evening of thursday a norfolk tugboat seized the favourable opportunity to desert from the rebel service and run into newport news its officers reported that norfolk was being evacuated by the confederates and that the two or three thousand troops yet there would probably soon be gone when therefore the officials and officers were once more assembled at fort monroe an immediate advance to norfolk was agreed upon and troops were again embarked on transports and other preparations hurried forward on friday night on saturday morning may ten a successful landing and debarkation was effected at the point examined by the president and general wool marched to norfolk with a force of nearly six thousand men it is easy to glean from the various accounts that there was great want of foresight and confusion in all the military arrangements and the secretary of the treasury who accompanied the advance was probably gratified by the entirely unexpected role of being for once in his life the generalissimo of a military campaign they met only the merest show of resistance and delay at a burning bridge which was overcome by an easy detour by evening they passed through the strong but abandoned entrenchments and received from the mayor of norfolk the official surrender of the city the navy yard at gosport was in flames but the heavy guns which armed the earthworks remained as trophies a military governor was appointed and protection promised to peaceful inhabitants and from that time forward norfolk remained under the authority of the union flag the most substantial fruit of the movement soon followed the officers of the merrimac observed on saturday morning from their moorings in the mouth of elizabeth river that the confederate flag was no longer flying over the sewell's point batteries and investigation during the day proved the landing and march of the union forces the precipitate retreat of the rebel troops from all points and the final surrender and occupation of norfolk the unwieldy crocodile back ironclad was thus caught between two fires the ship reports her commander was accordingly put on shore as near the mainland in the vicinity of craney island as possible and the crew landed she was then fired and after burning fiercely fore and aft for upward of an hour blew up a little before five on the morning of the eleventh the president receiving the welcome news at the moment of departure for washington prolonged his stay to accompany the delighted dignitaries and officers on a flying trip up elizabeth river to the newly captured town and then the prow of the miami on sunday evening ploughed past fort monroe and up the potomac so writes chase in conclusion has ended a brilliant week's campaign of the president for i think it quite certain that if he had not come down norfolk would still have been in possession of the enemy and the merrimac as grim and defined and as much a terror as ever the whole coast is now virtually ours like the merrimac the monitor also had a dramatic end after various services she was in the following december sent to sea under sealed orders and foundered in a gale off cape hatteras nearly all the officers and crew however being saved by boats from the rhode island which was towing her thus the pioneer ships of the new system of iron armor did not long survive their first famous exploit that so astounded the nations of the earth other union ironclads of a different model had joined the hampton road squadron before the destruction of the merrimac and before the monitor went down she had given her name as a generic term to a whole fleet built after her model her first successor the monitor passaic having already reached the seat of war for active service End of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Five, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Fourteen: Roanoke Island. Mention has been made of the very peculiar sea front of the state of North Carolina other states on the atlantic have like it the narrow fringe of sand-bank constituting the extreme outer coast within which lies a network of inlets islands bayous and rivers 
but north carolina unlike the rest contains behind this false coast a magnificent crescent-shaped inland sea whose sweeping outline covers more than a degree of latitude this vast watersheet has two separate names the upper or northern part called albemarle sound extends sixty miles west into the mainland and with a width of fifteen miles near the ocean and tapering to a point at the entrance of the chowan river the lower or southern part called pemlico sound is perhaps twice as large extending eighty miles to the southwest having a width of from ten to thirty miles and a depth of twenty feet varied by shoals both sounds would probably have been combined under a single name were it not that nearly midway of the ark lies roanoke island twelve miles long and three miles wide indicating a division though by no means separating them for their waters remain connected by the narrower croton sound on the west and roanoke sound on the east of the island when forts hatteras and clark were captured by the union forces on the twenty ninth of august eighteen sixty one the confederates fixed upon roanoke island as the nearest defensible point and began the erection of batteries to hold the narrow channels while the possession of the forts at hatteras inlet was of vast importance to the union blockading fleet it soon became evident that other lodgments must be made to afford full control of the interior waters of north carolina the hatteras forts built on the narrow banks of the outer coast line were not very defensible in high water they were nearly submerged and there was constant danger that they might be seriously damaged by the severe storms frequent on that coast officers of good judgment reported that they formed no suitable base for operations into the interior and recommended the capture and occupation of roanoke island its strategic value was so evident that it needed little urging upon the attention of the government it would form a safe and useful base of operations it would render blockade running in that locality well nigh impossible more important than all the complete occupation of the interior coast would open a practicable back door to richmond roanoke island wrote the local rebel commander is the key of one-third of north carolina and whose occupancy by the enemy would enable him to reach the great railroad from richmond to new orleans chance favored the gradual growth of an expedition for this work during the summer and autumn of eighteen sixty one while mcclellan was so tediously organizing his great army refusing to allow detachments and postponing all movements the potomac river fell into a condition of quasi blockade from rebel batteries hastily established at eligible points and which though from time to time shelled out and driven away persistently reappeared to endanger navigation for several months says the report of the secretary of the navy the commerce on this important avenue to the national capital was almost entirely suspended though at no time was the passage of our armed naval vessels prevented general mcclellan felt unwilling or unable to relieve this stress by a forward movement yet not entirely insensible to such a military disgrace almost at the tent doors of the army he took refuge in a half-way measure suggested by general ambrose e burnside his classmate and intimate friend and recommended the formation of a coast division with suitable vessels such as might be enlisted and collected from the various seacoast towns of new england the officers and men to be sufficiently conversant with boat service to manage steamers sailing vessels surf boats etc in short to be as expert in the duty of the sailor as of the soldier the whole to form an integral part of the army of the potomac but specially intended for operation in the inlets of the chesapeake bay and potomac river it was in the day of mcclellan's highest popularity when the government eagerly gratified his slightest wish accordingly general burnside was sent to carry out his own suggestion and succeeded without difficulty in raising the desired force the selection of commander was not injudicious burnside was a rhode islander and also a graduate of west point who had hitherto been singularly favored in attracting popular admiration and applause the governors of the states to which he was sent seconded his mission with praiseworthy zeal before he had finished his task wider designs were matured by the government and he was entrusted with the most important duty of leading his amphibious coast division to the waters of north carolina his regiments began assembling at annapolis early in november but incurring the usual delays the month of december passed before his whole force proceeded to his second rendezvous at fort monroe in complete preparation to set sail 
here also he was joined by a fleet of twenty vessels of war under command of flag officer goldsborough detailed to accompany and assist him general mcclellan gave burnside his final orders on january seventh eighteen sixty two directing him to assume command of the department of north carolina which had been created including the hatteras forts his instructions were first to seize and hold roanoke island then to capture new Bern, next to attempt the capture of fort macon and open the harbor of beaufort also if possible to penetrate into the interior from new Bern and seize the railroad at goldsboro the whole expedition went to sea from fort monroe on the evening of january eleventh eighteen sixty two burnside's army numbered a total of twelve thousand eight hundred and twenty nine men divided into three brigades respectively under generals john g foster jesse l reno and john g park these with their supplies were embarked on a motley collection of transports amounting to a hundred in number steamers schooners tugboats every description of craft that was deemed seaworthy and which could be made useful in the shadow north carolina sounds the whole fleet sailed under sealed orders which were opened when the vessels were twenty miles from fort monroe it was only a favorable day's run from the rendezvous to the hatteras forts and during that part of the voyage the fleet had the benefit of good weather but before the ships began to assemble the sea was so boisterous that there was great difficulty in passing through hatteras inlet some seventy of the vessels managed to get in behind the comparative shelter of the outer coast the others were compelled to encounter the fury of a storm which set in and which the general states continued almost incessantly twenty-eight days three steamers and half a dozen sailing vessels were lost but strange to say only three lives the remaining ships were by great exertion got through the inlet a few days after the arrival once inside another trouble was at hand a difficult bar called the bulkhead with only seven and a half feet of water had to be crossed and nearly a month of delay occurred in getting the expedition over this obstruction on the sixth of february the fleet renewed its advance numbering seventeen ships of war carrying forty-eight guns and seventy-five hundred troops the remainder of the force was left behind at hatteras the thirty-eight miles of intervening distance were soon passed over on the evening of february seven the men of war engaged the shore batteries on roanoke island during the long delay in the advance the enemy had become thoroughly informed of the expected attack and strengthened their position by every available device at best however it proved what the rebel commander called it an unequal conflict the principal defences consisted of several strong forts on the northern end of the island a row of piles and sunken vessels to obstruct the ship channel in croton sound and a fleet of seven rebel gunboats stationed behind it while goldsboro with his war vessels was engaging these on the afternoon of the seventh the army division was landed without serious resistance near ashby's harbor midway of the island the island is long and narrow and a principal road runs along the middle of it from south to north not far above the landing place what were supposed to be impenetrable swamps approached the road on either side leaving it a mere causeway across this causeway the rebels erected a strong breastwork and rifle pits to the right and left a force of infantry variously estimated at from one to two thousand supported this apparently serious obstruction early on the morning of the eighth the union troops advanced up the road foster the senior brigadier general in the centre park on the right and reno on the left while foster engaged the main work at the causeway with field pieces the other brigade commanders respectively undertook to flank it through the swamps to the right and left two hours passed in this effort and finally reno and his men forcing their way in the water waist-deep amid thick tangled underbrush succeeded in getting through the swamp on the left and occupying a fire on the right and rear of the enemy's battery park had also nearly succeeded in turning the position on the other side a simultaneous assault by foster in front and reno against the rebel right drove the enemy from their guns in precipitate confusion it was a victory of persistent and stubborn energy rather than severe fighting the total loss on the union side was five officers and thirty-two men killed and ten officers and two hundred and four men wounded the reported rebel loss was twenty-three killed and fifty-eight wounded the battle at this point decided the fate of the island the union troops 
followed the retreating enemy to the northern end with such promptness and vigor that they had no time or opportunity for further resistance the garrisons abandoned the forts and joined the flying column having no transports at hand in which to escape and finding himself surrounded colonel shaw the rebel commander sent a flag of truce to make a complete surrender the fruits of the day's fight says foster's report were the whole island of roanoke with its five forts thirty-two guns three thousand stands of arms and twenty-seven hundred prisoners ex-governor henry a wise of virginia upon whom as district commander the responsibility of this confederate disaster fell most heavily at the time made the following striking summary of the strategic importance of the capture of roanoke island it unlocked two sounds albemarle and curatuck eight rivers the north west pasquotank perquimans little chowan roanoke and alligator four canals the albemarle and chesapeake dismal swamp northwest and suffolk and two railroads the petersburg and norfolk and the seaboard and roanoke it guarded more than four-fifths of all norfolk's supplies of corn pork and forage and it cut the command of general huger off from all its most efficient transportation it endangers the subsistence of his whole army threatens the navy yard at gosport and to cut off norfolk from richmond and both from railroad communication with the south it lodges the enemy in a safe harbor from the storms of hatteras gives them a rendezvous and large rich range of supplies and the command of the seaboard from oregon inlet to cape henry however interesting might be the detailed narrative it would require more pages than can be devoted to it to describe how the natural fruits of the capture of roanoke island were in part gathered by successive expeditions within the north carolina sounds during the remainder of the year eighteen sixty two they can only be mentioned here in the briefest possible summary the rebel fleet which retreated was followed by a detachment of goldsboro's ships under commander rowan into the pasquatank river towards elizabeth city where on february tenth he completely annihilated it capturing one steamer burning and destroying five others and occupying elizabeth city and other points carrying out the original instructions another expedition naval and military sailed from roanoke island against the town of new Bern on the news river one of the southern affluents of pamlico sound where a combined attack on the fourteenth of march effected a quick reduction of the very considerable defense at that place the fruits of the victory at new Bern, reports general foster were the richest town in north carolina one steamer two hundred prisoners forty-six heavy guns eighteen field pieces several hundred stands of arms the command of the railroad the cutting off from supplies of the garrison at fort macon with a prospective capture of that work and the facilities of the railroad for our advance on goldsboro a small expedition also went march twentieth and twenty first up the pamlico river where the town of washington was occupied more important than either of the foregoing was the expedition under command of brigadier general park against fort macon guarding the harbor of beaufort north carolina and its successful investment siege and capture on the twenty sixth of april one of those brilliant engineering feats which throughout the war attested the high skill and accomplishments of the educated officers of the regular army in addition to these principal events there occurred a score or more of small expeditions reconnaissances skirmishes which there is not room to even enumerate it will thus be seen that the success of the parent expedition led by burnside against roanoke island quickly resulted in a secondary group of local victories which gave the union forces command of the entire interior coasts of north carolina of the several designs mentioned in mcclellan's original instructions as the objects of the burnside expedition all were accomplished save the single one of an advance from new Bern to goldsboro to seize one of the important southern railroads this had necessarily to await the preliminary work to which the army and navy next devoted themselves and required also an increase of force to hold the captured places and guard communications before the needful reinforcements were accumulated the goldsboro expedition was unfortunately rendered impossible by an unexpected change in the tide of union victories failure and disaster fell upon mcclellan's army in virginia to such a degree that burnside with all the troops he could bring with him was recalled early in july from north carolina to the james river 
nevertheless the points already gained in albemarle and pamlico sounds were generally held and through the remainder of the war their occupation contributed essentially in various ways to the further advance of the union arms simultaneously with the successes in north carolina other important victories attended the military and naval operations along the atlantic coast the hold which had been gained at port royal south carolina and the adjacent sea islands was greatly extended and strengthened notably in the siege and capture of fort pulaski at the mouth of the savannah river pulaski like macon was one of the old government forts built for coast protection which during the secession period were first seized and occupied by state troops and afterwards turned over to the control and use of the confederate authorities fort pulaski stood in a strong position on cockspur island georgia commanding both channels of the savannah river it was a brick work with walls seven and a half feet thick and twenty-five feet high with one tier of guns in casemate and one and barbette the island it stood on was wholly a marsh one mile long and a half mile wide the neighboring islands were also mere marshes the possibility of reducing the fort began to be studied soon after port royal was captured and the work formally commenced about the beginning of february the ground to operate upon was described as a soft unctuous mud free of grit or sand and incapable of supporting a heavy weight even in the most elevated places the partially dry crust is but three or four inches in depth the substratum being a semi-fluid mud which is agitated like jelly by the falling of even small bodies upon it like the jumping of men or ramming of earth a pole or an oar can be forced into it with ease to the depth of twelve or fifteen feet in most places the resistance diminishes with increase of penetration men walking over it are partially sustained by the roots of reeds and grass and sink in only five or six inches when this top support gives way they go down from two to two and a half feet and in some places much farther the problem was to transport the heavy material and guns about a mile and establish batteries in such a locality working without noise in the darkness of night it was necessary first to construct a causeway resting on fascines and brushwood in positions within range of the effective fire of the fort no one says the report except an eye-witness can form any but a faint conception of the herculean labor by which mortars of eight and a half tons weight and columbades but a trifle lighter were moved in the dead of night over a narrow causeway bordered by swamps on either side and liable at any moment to be overturned and buried in the mud beyond reach two hundred and fifty men were barely sufficient to move a single piece on sling carts the men were not allowed to speak above a whisper and were guided by the notes of a whistle yet the task was pursued with such industry that on the ninth of april eleven batteries comprising thirty-six guns were ready to open fire at distances varying from sixteen hundred and fifty to thirty four hundred yards and the fort was summoned to surrender at sunrise on the morning of april tenth a refusal having been received the bombardment was begun the fort making a vigorous reply the surprising and hitherto unknown effectiveness of rifled guns and modern projectiles was quickly proved by two o'clock of the second day's bombardment the fort was so far damaged by a large breach and the dismounting of eleven of its guns as to compel its surrender which took place that afternoon april eleventh eighteen sixty two the armament of the fort was forty eight guns its garrison of three hundred and eighty five men were made prisoners general quincy a gilmore conducted the siege operations general david hunter being at that time in command of the department of the south it will be remembered that when port royal was captured in the previous autumn it was the intention and expectation of the government that the forces engaged in that enterprise should proceed at once in an attempt to repossess and occupy the whole florida coast for reasons heretofore mentioned that project could not then be immediately carried out the design however was not abandoned and with the opening of the year eighteen sixty two preparations were made to renew the undertaking accordingly an expedition sailed from port royal during the month of march consisting of nineteen ships of war under flag officer samuel f dupont and a few transports carrying a brigade of volunteers under general h g wright which within a few days and without serious resistance occupied and thereafter securely held the whole remaining atlantic coast southward including brunswick fort clinch fernandina cumberland island and sound amelia sound jacksonville and st augustine 
nor did the triumphs of the navy end here while this reduction and repossession of the atlantic coast was going on another movement more formidable in its preparation and more brilliant in its successes was in progress end of chapter fourteen